trying to fend him off, but Ball Don't Lie has his mind on business, and Ball Don't Lie goes past inside the final eighth of a mile. Santa Arena is fighting bravely. Ball Don't Lie is just a little too good, though, and Ball Don't Lie wins going away. Santa Arena second, Winterfell third in front of Tour Player in Canada Gate. Jennifer's Delight. They're in the gate. And they're off. Queen Molotov rockets out of the gate. Excelia has some speed in second as they get to the main track. They're followed by Rugalach on the outside third. Then it's Foolish on the fence, fourth, but only a length off the lead. Then comes Racinto Rompere racing in mid-pack just in front of Alternate Rock. Jennifer's Delight is outside of her. She's got away, has six to make up, three in front of Haley LeVay. Queen Molotov passes the half-mile pole, pressed by Excelia, just a head back second. At the rail, Foolish in third, Rugaloch, Recinto, Rompere in between rivals. Then Jennifer's Delight and Alternate Rock right together. She's got away, eight lengths off the lead with the new leader, Excelia, and Haley Levade has to pick it up from behind. Excelia turns for home. Here's Recinto, Rompere coming after her in second. There's room for Foolish running a good race down at the rail. Just behind them, Alternate Rock has Queen Molotov drops back. Jennifer's Delight is next. Recinto Rompere on the outside up to take the lead, a 16th out. And it's another for Frankie de Torre as Recinto Rompere wins it by two. Alternate Rock rallied well to get the play spot. Battle for third was among Foolish, Excelia, and Jennifer's Delight. Thank you, racing fan. We're in the gate. And they're off in the evening jewel stakes presented by the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. And Roberta's Love is the quickest out of the gate. Clubhouse Bride came away in good order. Mirinda moves through at the rail, taking third, now up for second. Quick Kate is fourth through the opening furlongs. Safa in the yellow colors and Grease Missile, but it's a compact group behind Roberta's Love who heads to the half-mile pole, pressed by Clubhouse Bride, a neck away in second. Safa is tugging hard in between horses. Down at the rail comes Marinda, Grease Missile widest of all, and Quick Kate behind them. Three eights to run, and it's Roberta's Love, a neck in front, Clubhouse Bride second. Marinda two off them, Orange Cap at the rail in third. Then Safa now with breathing room in fourth. At the rail, Quick Kate and Grease Missile. They have a quarter of a mile to run. Roberta's Love and Clubhouse Bride heads apart. Roberta's Love digs in at the rail, opens up a length and a half. Marinda still with plenty of work to do. Safa in the center of the racetrack. One furlong left for Roberta's Love. Safa becoming a threat on the outside. And Clubhouse Bride is valiant in between them. It's Roberta's Love who keeps on going. Safa on the chase. Roberta's Love. Roberta's Love has won the evening jewel presented by the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. Safa game in defeat. Then Clubhouse Bride and Quick Kate. What a day so far for Frankie DeTori. That's his third. Next, race five. Post time in 22 minutes. Very fractious in the gate. There is blue fashion. Blue fashion reared up in the gate. Settles down. And they're off. She's the law is quick. So is Tahini. In between those two, Kathy and Marissa has some sharp early speed too. So it's Tahini just in front, Kathy and Marissa, and she's the law now in third. Brunch with Amy settles in fourth, followed by Certitude in the green colors down at the rail, a little bit keen behind horses, four lengths off the pace, rounding the clubhouse turn. That group is followed by Lottery, racing on the inside of Greer, my dear. 
Two more lengths to Blue Fashion. Poppy's Joy is next and a break of four. Back to strike when ready. On to the back stretch behind Tahini, who has a two-length advantage. Kathy and Marissa in the clear second. At the rail, it's She's the Law in third. They're followed by Brunch with Amy and Certitude right together, as are Greer, My Dear, and Lottery with less than a half mile to go. Another couple of lengths to Blue Fashion, Poppy's Joy, and Strike when ready. Not much change in the order. It's Tahini into the far turn, three-length lead. Kathy and Marissa just in front of She's the Law, second and third. Certitude is by herself in fourth. Now Lottery is getting going. And there goes Lottery, fifth in the white colors with some nice momentum, has six lengths to make up as the field turns for home. Tahini is loose by three, chased by Kathy and Marissa. She's the law. Lottery is a little bit awkward now, getting her going in the middle of the course. But in the meantime, Frankie de Tori's on fire, and Kathy and Marissa has come to take the lead. And it's going to be four in a row for the legend. Frankie DeTori, Kathy and Marissa wins convincingly. Lottery second. She's the law. Certitude behind that between Tahini and Poppy's Joy. This one is Corposo in the colors of Slam Dunk Racing. Going in. They're in the gate. And they're off in the Santa Anita Oaks. And Copian is sent hard out of the gate. Kinza with her natural speed is a little quicker once again. And Kinza will be the pacemaker with Copian right off her flank. Corposo, nothing like you is down at the rail. And if you ain't first, you're last at the back of the field. The favorite Kinza opens up a length and a half. Nothing like you and Copian are side by side. And a three deep Corposo is just two and a half or so off the lead. Eight lengths back to if you ain't first, you're last. Less than six furlongs to go. Juan Hernandez and Kinza lead the way by a length and a half. Copian is clearly into second as Corposo takes third. Nothing like you is next. If you ain't first, you're last. Far back. They're heading to the half mile pole in the Santa Anita Oaks. And Kinza is dictating terms. Gets a little nudge, but leads by a length and a half. Copian is in second. Nothing like you has to get closer at the rail. And Corposo still very much in the thick of it on the outside, taking third, rounding the far turn. Three eighths to run. Kinza, a length. Copian set down. Corposo running a good race on the outside and nothing like you at the rail. Three lengths covers this group. Nothing like you looking for some racing room at this stage. As Corposo comes to Kinza at the top of the stretch. Kinza, Corposo, Copian in between them. The rail opens for nothing like you and what a run from nothing like you who runs by her stablemate Kinza and opens up with authority. Nothing like you and Frankie DeTori turning the Santa Anita Oaks into a romp. What a tremendous performance from nothing like you, who wins by eight widening lengths. Kinza second, Corposo third, then Copian, Frankie DeTori, simply unstoppable with five wins in a row. Here's Summer Lake. We're in the gate. And they're off. Clean start. Henny's crazy train and Summer Lake out alertly. Irresistible force. And here comes Just Nails. And Just Nails able to clear the field inside the first furlong. Irresistible Force now second. Summer Lake is in third. Then it's Henny's Crazy Train. Royal Charter three deep in fifth. Not now settles in mid-pack. Pastiche is down at the rail. It's another couple to the gray. Sunshine Babe, who's nine lengths off the lead with less than six furlongs to go. Pleasant Wave and Irish Patsy, the next pair, followed by Mrs. Astor and Clean Karma at the back of the field. Just Nails takes them onto the back stretch with a three-length advantage irresistible force racing between rivals third henny's crazy train royal charter is next and then it's summer lake fifth five lengths off the lead as they get to the half mile pole not now is next racing on the outside of pastiche in the blue at the rail two in front of sunshine bay pleasant wave irish patsy mrs astor and clean karma 
Just Nails has been the controlling speed, pursued by irresistible force midway on the far turn. Henny's Crazy Train third royal chart is fourth. Then it's Summer Lake inching up as is not now on the outside. Green cap, pastiche is in behind them. Irish Patsy in the orange, a dozen off the pace. They're a furlong from the finish. Just Nails clinging narrowly. Here comes Royal Charter and Frankie DeTore on the outside. And Royal Charter is up to take the lead, a 16th to go. Six in a row for the amazing Frankie DeTore. Royal Charter by three. Irresistible force, Henny's crazy train. Then it was a wild scramble. Sunshine Babe, Irish Patsy was on the scene to be a part of the photo for fifth. But this story today is simply about Frankie DeTore. Starts with the upcoming eight. and thirsty walking up and in and they're off tis a good thing so i'm told is flashing sharp early speed and on the far outside good and thirsty so it's good and thirsty and so i'm told vying for early command left hand man is two lengths back in third tis a good thing now fourth california tiger is down at the rail a gap of six to Big Bet Jaffin Safa, and the trailer is The Big Wham. So I'm told, good and thirsty, stride for stride into the far turn. California Tiger in a tad tight, green silks down at the rail, and left-hand man is racing in between horses. Tis a good thing, with the white cap as a close-up, fifth, four lengths off the lead. Big Bet Jaffin Safa is called on, starts to lengthen that big stride of his, and a gap of four to The Big Wham. It's good and thirsty passing the quarter pole just in front as the field turns for home. Left hand man looming large and running right on by. Left hand man is the new leader of Furlong from the finish. California Tiger switches to the outside for a crack at left hand man and Kazushi Kimura, who have a three length lead close to home. And left hand man levels out nicely to score comfortably. California Tiger was second. The big wham rallied from nowhere for third. Big bet, Jeff and Safa. And fifth went to good and thirsty. <laughs> Only Lafitte Pink Eye Jr. has ever won seven races in a day at Santa Anita Park. It happened 37 years ago. Frankie DeTore tries it now. They're off in the Monrovia. And it's a very even start. Graceland Gray, very quick, and quickly sprints up on the inside. But A.G. Bullet wants that lead too. And A.G. Bullet and Graceland Gray are going at it in the opening furlongs. Get the money in a good spot third. Lucky Girl is fourth with four lengths to make up. It's another four to Chismosa, racing on the outside of Comanche Country. And at the back of the field is stretch running Miss Lizzie, who's about a dozen lengths off the lead. Graceland Gray has a narrow advantage, pressed by A.G. Bullet down the hill with Get the Money, three lengths back in third. Lucky Girl is fourth at this stage. Chismosa trying to make some headway from fifth. Six off the lead, Comanche Country and Miss Lizzie. They're at the top of the stretch. A.G. Bullet, Graceland Gray haven't given each other any breather whatsoever. A.G. Bullet takes the lead, get the money, is in third. Lucky Girl in the center of the course, inside the eighth pole. And A.G. Bullet pulls away from Graceland Gray in the center of the course. Chief Mosa, Miss Lizzie is flying through traffic, but it will be A.G. Bullet. Razor sharp in the Monrovia. A solid rally from Miss Lizzie to complete the exacta. Behind them, it was a photo, get the money. Lucky girl, Graceland Gray and Chismosa. DJ won the cup, completes the line. We're in the gate. And 
and they're off in the Santa Anita Derby and Stronghold gets the first call. EJ won the cup. Imagination broke beautifully in between them and puts his head in front. Now Tapolo rushes up along the inside to engage Imagination. And just behind them, Winstock fifth through the opening furlong. Tesudo outside Curlin's Chaos. McVeigh three wide and last. Tapolo will be the pace setter. Opens up two on Imagination second. EJ won the cup in the center of the track. Between rivals, Stronghold and Curlin's Chaos is down at the rail. Winstock has five lengths to make up. McVeigh is next. Having a little bit of a difficult time is McVeigh. And another two back to Tessuto. They move on to the back stretch and it's Tapolo and Umberto Rispoli setting the tempo. Imagination gliding up to him in second and EJ won the cup is three wide in third. Another three back to Stronghold who's patiently handled fourth, three and a half lengths off the pace at this stage. Winstock is fifth past the half mile pole. Curlin's chaos down at the rail. The two trailers are Tessuto and McVeigh. Heading to the 3 8 pole, Tapolo, Imagination, yet to be called on a length and a half back second. Stronghold awaiting racing room. He's just inside. EJ won the cup. Then Curlin's Chaos, Winstock, another three to Tessuto and McVeigh. Imagination making his move past the quarter pole. EJ won the cup, running a good race on the outside. Tapolo is down at the rail and Stronghold won from the outside. A driving finish. Stronghold bursts through between horses and is up to take the lead at the furlong pole. Imagination trying to match strides with him and EJ won the cup in third. It's Imagination and Stronghold knows and knows in the San Anita Derby. Stronghold chest in front and Stronghold prevails under Antonio Fresu, who's jubilant, understandably, in this great moment, defeating Imagination. EJ won the cup, was third. set and they're off stamp my passport broke alertly so did mystification who's up to take the lead here's the gray Faustin moving right into contention and now Faustin is quickest fleet feet moves up and man among men is up and on the pace just off the leaders the length to make up as they move into the first turn they are followed by one of these days racing on the inside of barely functional Outside of that pair comes Santo Dios, down at the rail, stamp my passport, who broke well and now settles. Alligato in the white colors is next, racing a couple of lengths in front of Sydney Street. Ottoman Prince and Frankie de Torre are second to last, and Short Man trails. They straighten up for the run down the back stretch, and there are three of them vying for the lead. Fleet feet on the far outside. Faustin is racing in between rivals, and down at the rail, mystification. Another two lengths back to an eager Santo Dios who's trying to come after that trio. Down at the rail, man among men. He's fifth, pushed along at this stage, asked for a bit more. Alligato has surfaced within five lengths of the lead, barely functional in one of these days just inside of him. Ottoman Prince has eight lengths to make up. He's followed by Stamp My Passport, short man, widest of all. Sydney Street at the back. They're at the top of the stretch and Mystification maintains a narrow advantage. Faustin trying hard in second. Center of the course, here's Alligato and Diego Herrera coming swiftly. And Alligato with good momentum at the 16th pole is up to battle for the lead. A tough Mystification goes with him, but it will be Alligato to prevail. Faustin in a photo with Mystification and in behind them, it was a battle among several, including Man Among Men and Barely Functional. Post time in 23 minutes. Then in suspense, followed by tour player in fifth between horses, Broheim and Canada Gate. Quarter of a mile to go, and the Glad Horses won two. 
It's Santarena and Ball Don't Lie moves to engage. Ball Don't Lie, Santarena, Santarena trying to fend him off, but Ball Don't Lie has his mind on business, and Ball Don't Lie goes past inside the final eighth of a mile. Santarena is fighting bravely. Ball Don't Lie is just a little too good, though, and Ball Don't Lie wins going away. Santarena second, Winterfell third in front of tour player in Canada Gate. Alertly, but he's not the quickest out of there. It's Prince Prancelot coming through on the inside and known idea once again flashing his early zip. Then Shady Tiger two off them in third. Down at the rail, stay on the fence is fourth and Tom Siever will race from fifth, three and a half lengths off the pace. Refocus is next. Last call, London and Frankie DeTori have five to make up. Climbing on horse's heels just behind that group. A gap of four to two by four and Puddinhead Jones is the trailer. Into the far turn, it's Prince Prancelot, three quarters of a length. Known idea, traveling comfortably enough in second. Tom Sieber joins them three deep. At the rail, stay on the fence under pressure. Shady Tiger is next. A length and a half clear of refocus. And in behind them comes last call, London. Still a big gap to two by four and Puddinhead Jones. Tom Sieber powers up on the outside to take the lead at the top of the stretch. Prince Prancelot, known idea is in between them. In the center of the racetrack, Shady Tiger and Shady Tiger runs right on by. Shady Tiger and Juan Hernandez turning the Echo Eddy into a one-horse affair. The son of Smiling Tiger, Shady Tiger, strolls in by six widening lengths. It's a photo for second. Stay on the fence and two by four, then Tom Seaver. This is...
In the music industry, Bruce Springsteen is known as the boss. But here at Sanita, El Jefe is sitting right next to me, the boss of Sanita, at least in the press box. He's been the dean of the press box for many, many decades. He's a wealth of knowledge, and it's a privilege to welcome to the seminar his name, Jeff Siegel. Jeff, happy Sunday. Welcome to the seminar. Thank you. Closing day. So, uh squeeze a you know, appearance in here before we take a week off. I took off opening week, unfortunately. I was under the weather after flying back from Hawaii, but we had Peter and other people from the simulcast set fill in admirably as you were the guest. And let's talk about yesterday's performance, uh, Jeff. Obviously, the 12 race a card, which was wagered $19 million on that entire card. Thanks to each and every one of you for wagering and participating on the card. The highlight of the meet, of course, and the highlight of the day was the Sandy to Derby. Let's, let's relive yesterday's 10th race. And listen to Frank Miramai describe them from the far turn to the wire. Curlin's chaos down at the rail. The two trailers are Tesudo and McVeigh. Heading to the three eighth pole, Tapolo, imagination yet to be called on a length and a half back second. Stronghold awaiting racing room. He's just inside, EJ won the cup. Then Curlin's chaos, Winstock, another three to Tesudo and McVeigh. Imagination making his move past the quarter pole. EJ won the cup, running a good race on the outside. Tapolo is down at the rail and Stronghold won from the outside. A driving finish, Stronghold bursts through between horses and is up to take the lead at the furlong pole. Imagination trying to match strides with him and EJ won the cup in third. It's Imagination and Stronghold nose and nose in the San Anita Derby. Stronghold chest in front and stronghold prevails under Antonio Fresu, who's jubilant, understandably, in this great moment, defeating imagination. EJ won the cup was third. Lot, lot of enthusiasm there, Jeff. Of course, we heard Frank Miramati's call. That was an epic battle. Antonio Fresu at the wire also was very interesting. Hard to beat Frankie Dettori yesterday, but Tony did. What did you think of Stronghold's performance? I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, he showed some courage <clears throat> because that was not an easy trip. He was buying horses. He had to squeeze his way between horses and then try to outfinish a very game and very tough imagination who was a seasoned horse and a uh, horse that had come off a, a nice win. And I thought he showed a lot of moxie in that race. I know that the buyer guys only gave him an 89. I think that's about five pounds or five points less than what it should have been. I think they kind of shortchanged him there. Um, so uh, if you think he's going to get better for the Kentucky Derby, and I do as a son of Go Sapper, they generally get better with age and distance and maturity and experience. Um, I think he's got a very good chance to at least hit the board. I, I can't say he's going to go out and win it yet, uh, although I wouldn't put it past him. But I expect him to, uh, to at least be uh, very competitive. We saw Sierra Leone win the Bluegrass at Keeling. We also saw Fierceness win the uh, Florida Derby last weekend as well. Where do you think Stronghold fits within those three? Are those the three leading candidates for the Kentucky Derby in your estimation? Yeah, I mean, Fierceness to me is so much faster on numbers than uh, everybody else. And um, he's not a need the lead type, but he wants to be in the fray and he wants to get out of there cleanly. So the key to a Fierceness will be the first eighth of a mile. If he can uh, secure a good trip, He's, and he runs back to either one of his uh, best two, two best races. He's going to be almost impossible to beat, I think. Um, so I like him. Um, uh, Sierra Leone is a good, consistent, genuine, relentless type of horse. I'm actually more convinced he's going to run his race than Fierceness was. But if Fierceness runs his race, he's better, I think. So I think those are the two. And then I think Stronghold has got to be given a, a, a legitimate look to, again, hit the board he's going to have a great trip in the second flight he keeps himself trouble free and he just he's got a long move he's not a, not a short move so they can put him into the race and expect that he'll stay on pretty nicely the only axiom is pace makes the race and certainly for the kentucky derby pace is going to make the race when it comes to to the kentucky derby fierceness if he gets away with a soft early pace will be tough if the pace is hot and heavy then certainly that's going to set it up for sierra leone i don't see a lot of pace in here i see a lot of horses who want to lay fairly close but there's no sprinter stretching out. We don't have that anymore. Yeah, because you know, of the points. Because of the points. So you can't, you know, uh, hire a rabbit or something to go in there because you can't get in the race. So in projecting the pace flow, uh, I think Fierceness is going to be just where he wants to be. Doesn't have to be in front as long as he's in the clear. I think actually more important for him would be where he's drawn. Sure. If he's outside, he can kind of pick his spot. But if he's downside, down inside, gets bounced around a little bit, gets behind horses in the dirt in his face then he could be vulnerable. So that's why it's a race. If, if that wasn't hanging over his uh, neck, around his neck, I think uh, 
uh, fierceness would be a very short price, but there are enough people who don't trust him, which is why the others will get some play. They say there's no substitute for experience, and certainly Frankie Dettori has a lot of experience. What a clinic he put on yesterday. We really witnessed history. The crowd was energized. Obviously, it made national press headlines as well. It's just such a breath of fresh air to have Frankie riding here on a regular basis in Southern California. Now, today he's not here. I'm sure the jocks in the room are very happy he's not here. <laughs> but what an exhibition he put on yesterday. Short, long, turf, dirt, it doesn't matter. He's a world-class rider. Well, you know, he had been announced that he was going to retire last year and went through that kind of retirement tour, you know, and finally it dawned on him, why am I retiring? I can still ride. I can ride with these guys. And winning what, races. What am I going to do? Yeah. Um, so uh, now that he's here, um, he's going to be in demand for sure, especially in the major stakes races, which is what he really wants to ride in. Um, but he, uh, yesterday on the undercard, was just absolutely spectacular. Uh, Baffert might not have won the San Diego Derby, but he did win the San Diego Oaks, but with a filly that wasn't uh, really uh, expected to win the race. It was the other Bob Baffert at a much bigger price, and the and the, and the odds-on favorite certainly was disappointing also from the Baffert barn. Yeah, I mean, uh, Bob, he tends to do that. I remember when um, Real Quiet beat Indian Charlie. Remember sure, that? of course. He was supposed to beat Indian Charlie. So if Bob's got another horse in the race, you, you got to respect him and uh, – um, you know, he's got others uh, that uh, that uh, can step up and, and be of that level, too, uh, that we quite haven't seen the best of yet. We all respect Jeff Siegel's opinion. We're going to find out who he likes on today's 11 race card. But before we do any of that, let's toss the microphone over to track announcer Frank Miramati and get the changes on today's Sunday's card here at the Great Race Place. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park, the great race place. The track is fast and the turf course is firm. The rail on the turf is out 10 feet. Here are the early changes. In the first, number five, Mighty Kai will carry one pound over. In the second, number three, Bossy Bruingau, two pounds over. In the third, number five, headed for Ohm, two pounds over. And we have the program scratch of number nine. Fourth race, number one, Dance Man, one pound over. The fifth race, we offer the middle pick four again today. It's the John Shear, no high five way drink, scratch six, Nesso's last hurrah. In the six, scratch number six, Deficit Maha. Sixth race kicks off the pick six. We do have mandatory payouts in all pools today. In the seven, scratch 10, Ace Ace Baby. And the also eligibles, 13 and 14. The late pick five starts here, as does the all turf pick three on races seven, nine, and 11. In the eighth race, there are no changes. The ninth is the Angel's Flight, scratch two, Rascality, and scratch four, Avoir, two and four out of the ninth. In the 10th, program scratches of one and 11, the Golden Hour late pick four starts here. Some blinker notes as well. And in the 11th, the beginning of the Golden Hour double, no scratches or jockey changes. Enjoy your day at the Great Race Place. Lots of family fun activities in the infield. 36,000 eggs for kids to hunt. Lots of fun. Great racing. We take a break. No racing next weekend. Racing will resume a week from Friday. So mandatory payouts in all pools today. No live racing next weekend. We are open next weekend for simulcast wagering. Let's go back to Quigley's Corner in the paddock today. Tom Quigley and Jeff Siegel.
Welcome back. We're talking horse with Jeff Siegel. He's the dean of the Sandy Indian Press Box. He's been involved in many endeavors, but we're fortunate enough to have him here at Sandy Indian on a daily basis. You can find his selections right on the Sandy Indian website, absolutely free of charge. You'll be a better handicapper because of that. Jeff, a lot of ground to cover with 11 races, but there's also one other topic to talk about before we get into the 11 races here, and that's the Coast to Coast Pick 5. It's offered every Saturday and Sunday with races between uh, Gulfstream Park and Sandy. Indian. The reason why it's so important today is First Bet has seeded $100,000 into the pool already consider that quote unquote free money and you can see it starts with sandy to race three all five races in today's coast to coast pick five are turf races both at, both at gulfstream park and sandy the ex expectations are the pool is going to be huge and it's a thank you from first bet for all the support that this new wager has gotten from the public around the country make sure you get involved with the coast to coast pick five you can see four of the five races originate right here from the great race place okay jeff let's go circle back to sandy and take a look at race number one which begins the 50 cent early pick five and today because it's closed day of the winter meet mandatory paths in all pools including the early pick five the pick six etc etc and we're going one mile on the turf course for thirty two thousand dollar claimers non-winners of two races lifetime the turf rails today are at 10 feet we've got a field of nine the original morning line favorite was number four but the one taking the betting action at the moment is number seven remote remote three to one on the board from a five to one morning line how'd you see race one jeff well this is one of those non-winners of two races so Everybody here is one for something, and some of these are one for a lot, you know. So when I handicap a race like this, I'd like to find a horse that maybe hasn't been quite as exposed as some of the others, like um, number four, National General, is one for 19. I don't think I need him, you know, because... If he beats you, he beats you. What do I care? You know? Risk and reward, it doesn't make any sense. He's not going to cost me a ton of money if he wins, and I'd just as soon try to spend it on somebody else. At they a better have, price. At a better price. Number one, what a dude is not a major price, but I think he's going to run well here. Second off, a long layoff, stretching out. I uh, had a good sprint tightener here uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think he's going to use that good rail to good advantage. He's coming out of a sprint. He wasn't too far back off a of 44-2, so he shouldn't have to – used too hard to get a good position he has run well turning to turning in fact he broke his maiden two turning at aqueduct back in november of 22 so i mean it's not like he can't route and he didn't run all that badly at this over this course and distance last year uh when he was fourth beaten less than two lengths with a buyer number that puts him right there so i'm gonna give a little bit of a gamble with number one what a dude hot rider no question about that um uh, we'll put him in the race so i like him and then uh you know, the Rachel Dandy is a horse who's probably just as good, but he's one for 20, so I don't need him either. Maybe you can back up with him if you like, but I'm going to go try a, a little bit of a small gamble. He is 6-1 to one in the morning line, probably go lower than that. Number one, what a dude. One and three in race number one. Let's turn the page, take a look at race number two. Begins the 50-cent early pick four. This time we're traveling one mile on the main track. It's for three-year-old fillies or fillies and mares, four-year-olds and up which have never won two races, $16,000 of the claiming tag. There is one three-year-old in the field, Bossy Bruingale, who does have multiple career victories. However, the morning line favorite drawn right outside of her number four, Midnight Silence, eight to five on the morning line. Did you know any Bossy Bruingales when you were going to school at UCLA? Uh, too many. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like her today or are you look at elsewhere? Um, she's, uh, she's okay. She's kind of slow on numbers. Uh, Bossy Bruingale um, has good tactical speed in a small field, should get a good trip. Um, but uh, Midnight Silence, the five-year-old older mare, and uh, while she's just one for 14 and 0 for 8 on this uh, track, she has hit the board seven times. So I, I'd rather just say that she's overdue for a win here than anything that I mean, she doesn't want to win. And the last time Midnight Silence ran, she was second, but she was five clear of everybody else. So she thinks she kind of won, you know, I think. So um, Braden knows her well, and, and she's got a good stalking style. So I'll go with... Uh, I'm not saying she's any great gamble at 8 to 5 on the morning line, but midnight silence over a bossy brewing gal looks pretty logical. Let's call her the most likely winner in race number right. two. Let's turn the page, take a look at race number three, one of multiple races coming down the hillside turf course in race three. This is for Calbred, Phillies and Mares. It's an allowance race. Program scratch of the nine leaves us with a field of eight. Number seven, proof she zips from the Michael McCarthy barn. is 5 to 2 on the morning line. Umberto Rispoli in the saddle. What are your thoughts on race three, Jeff? I like her uh, proof she zips. I was actually at Golden Gate. Uh, when she ran uh, April 30th of last year, was doing the simulcast. And um, I thought she ran unbelievably well that day. I was kind of waiting for her to run back, and she never did until now. She got beat ahead, but she went 45 and change um, to the half. And 
that's like 44 here going along on the grass. That's a deeper, slower turf course. Correct. So I thought she ran well, got nailed right on the money by Carol Lombard. Uh, well clear of everybody else, and it was a hot race. And unfortunately, she must have come out of the race somewhat worse for work because we don't see her again until now. But she's trained very well for Michael McCarthy. Uh, she had a good breeze over the uh, all-weather surface here about a week ago. I think she's fit, um, and uh, she can sprint just as well as she can route. And in a race like this that does not have a lot of speed signed on down the hill, I think Rispoli can put proof she zips anywhere he wants, uh, either on the lead if they give it to her or just any second. doesn't matter. But at 5-2 to two in the morning line, she is a, a prime play for me today, number seven, Proof She Zips. And Proof She Zips, if you're looking at the past performances and look at her performance before that Golden Gate effort back on March 19th of last year at San Anita, she was actually running against the boys that day and finished a good second as well. So the talent in the class is there. The question is whether she's ready off the layoff. We'll find out today, that's for sure. Race number four, sprinting on the main track, six furlongs the distance for maiden claiming Calbritts, $50,000 of the claiming tag. We've got a field of six. Number two, Antonson from the car. Carla Gaines Barn is eight to five on the Moy line. Here's another one that's had a few starts, four starts with one second and one third of move forward today. Or are you looking elsewhere, Jeff? I think he'll probably run his race. He, he, if you look at the form, you notice that he didn't debut until he was a four year old at Del Mar in August. I remember him when he was a two and a three year old, and he looked like the goods. He was breezing like, like he could be a stakes horse. And he, he got entered in the race and got scratched and then turned turned out and disappeared again for another year and a half. Or, so he was cut out to be a good horse, but he doesn't change leads. He's obviously has uh, physical problems. Um, he had a perfect trip last time and couldn't win, but he was clear of everybody else. Maybe this is a field he can outrun. Uh, again, eight to five in the morning line. He seems like a logical top pick. I don't think there's value here, but uh, I don't have an alternative. So I, I'm going to hope that Antonson finally does earn his uh, maiden diploma at age five. Jeff, let's talk about the trials and tribulations of horse ownership for a moment, because you've certainly owned your, your fair share of horses throughout the uh, throughout the years. And as horse players, we just pick up the racing form and start handicapping horses that are, you know, are right in front of our face. But as a horse owner, you have to go through all those ups and downs just to get to a horse to a race. It's kind of a miracle that so many people want, want to be involved in horse ownership, isn't it? Simply because of the roller coaster ride. The thrill is in the hunt, and certainly there's no other experience like winning a race. But wow, it's a really tough game when it comes to owning horses if it was easy it wouldn't be that thrilling you know you gotta you've gotta really uh not not only be lucky but you've got to sink some serious money into the game and you got to be prepared to lose it i mean that's what i say when we were doing team valor uh back in the when barry erwin and i started in the 80s and went all the way uh for 20 years martial law right martial law for one and several others um we told people look pretend you're going on a cruise okay like, you're going to go on a cruise. You're going to have fun. And you're going to have fun. And when you get back, nobody's going to ask you whether you've made money or not. <laughs> you're going to say, I, oh, I had fun. I had a great time. You know, well, that's what the horse ownership is. Now, you could make money. You can do it. But that's not why you're in the game. You're in the game to be part of the game. It's a tough game. But when you do win, it really is thrilling. It, 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 it makes the thing all worthwhile. And uh, um, whether you're a breeder or you buy in the yearling sales or the two-year-old sales or claim, um, you know, it's it's why you're doing it, because you enjoy the sport. And you can make the same uh, statement for horse players as well, right? You come out for a day at the races and you're going to lose a couple hundred dollars. Now, if you go to the movies or a Lakers game, you're not going to be able to walk out of there with more, more, more money than mm -hmm. when you walked into the arena with. But there's a possibility. So horse players on a much smaller scale kind of go through that same sort of uh, exhilaration. Maybe, but I always when I gambled, I wanted to win. <laughs> <laughs> Horning horses is a different thing. That's sure. fun. But if I'm putting my money through the windows, I'm expecting to get something back. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we all are. That's why you're on the <laughs> seminar today. Race number five on today's 11 race card offers a 50 cent middle pick for a wager. And we're coming down the hillside turf course. This is the first of two stakes races on today's uh, card. It's named in honor of John Shear, the longtime paddock captain here at San Diego, who passed away at the ripe old age of 102 years old. What an, what an inspiration he was for so many of us. And the John Shear stakes today is for three-year-olds, as I mentioned, coming down the hill. One scratch. Scratch the six. Leaves us with a field of six. Number four hard-headed from the John Sadler barn ridden by Juan Hernandez is eight to five on the morning line. How'd you see race five, Jeff? Tough race. I mean, I couldn't throw any of these horses out, but I ended up settling with number one, King of Gosford, the English bred uh, colt trained by Phil D'Amato, who was very impressive, I thought, in his U.S. debut. Now, his form overseas was just moderate, but like so many of these imports in the D'Amato barn, they get better when they get here. And this Colt, uh, I thought, uh, won nicely. He was part of a pace. Uh, that was on the flat course. He's going to six and a half down the hill now. 
And uh, I think he'll be inside speed here, and uh, we'll see if he can uh, improve just a little bit. That's all he'll need uh, to win right back. And you give a little love to number four, hard-headed as well, the morning line favorite from Sadler Brown. Broke from the rail last time out. Would you prefer not to be on the rail when you're sprinting, whether it's coming down the hill or on the flat turf course? Is there a distinction or a difference in your mind, generally speaking? Generally, I'd, I would pr probably not be wanting to be on the rail down the hill. I think the, the flat course, it's okay. But there's only six in here, and so they usually load them from the outside to the middle. So I don't think that's going to bother King of Gosford. As for hard-headed, he really did run well in the Baffert. In fact, he struck the front and then got nailed by Stay Hot right on the money. So he, he's another horse who I think he thinks he won. Um, Numbers-wise, they're very close. Um, but he at least has the option to sit back a little bit and let the other ones do the dirty work and to make a run. Whereas King of Gosford, I think his, his handle will be forced to, to go up there and uh, make the running. And if he does and he's not pressured, then uh, he's got a, a really good chance. It's a good for good thing for him that Nesso's last hurrah was scratched. He was part of the pace, so it might not be that quick. So uh, I think it's either the one or the four in that race, King of Gosford or hard-hearted. I'm sorry, Jeff. Race number six begins the $1 pick six. As I mentioned earlier, mandatory pad. Everything must go today, including the $1 pick six. And we kick things off in the pick six, bringing six furlongs in the main track for three-year-old fillies in for a $32,000 tag. Scratch the six leaves us with a field of five. Number two, Bella Pock from the Doug O'Neill barn is nine to five on the Moy line. One last time out, but was also a void claim. Comes back at the same level. Has a lot of early speed. What say you about race six? Well, I'm looking at Dory Miller, who was originally six to one on the morning line, and she won't be now because of the scratch. But um, if you look at her form, her last two races were on grass. One of them was a two-turn race. Both were against tougher than what she's seeing here. You go back three races back and find out that she finished second in that race, four clear of everybody else, uh, and uh, and earned a, a, a good, strong speed figure for this level at this level. And she had trouble that day. I mean, she was settled, made a premature move inside, ran into the roadblock, got stopped, then re-rallied again and was up to be second. I think if she runs back to that race, number four, Dory Miller, uh, can win. Um, and uh, I, I suspect that she will. I, I think that there's a, a reasonable gamble for Dory Miller. Now, she has no early speed, but she's another one of these um, fillies who can make an extended run. And I think if she gets the patient ride she needs and doesn't try to do too much too early, I think she can uh, tag the speed. You kind of understand why the new connections for Dory Miller maybe tried her on the turf being a daughter of Gray's. And obviously, as you mentioned, that didn't work out. They gave her two chances, once two turning and one sprinting, as you mentioned, but now coming back to a more realistic level. So certainly, she, certainly she makes sense from a handicapping standpoint, not necessarily about Dory Miller, but just in general, Jeff, how much attention do you pay to pedigree before it becomes basically no longer valid? Is it just a horse's first couple starts? Is it maybe when they try a surface for the first time? Like, when do you incorporate pedigree into your handicapping? I give them a couple of starts, you know. I mean, if you see a horse, you know, he's bred for grass and they run them on the grass or a couple of times and there's no change, then it doesn't mean that much. Uh, I look at all weather for them, too. Uh, not necessarily here, but at Golden Gate, um, uh, there's there are horses that, believe it or not, love all weather but don't like grass most of them do but they, you know, they're, it's, it's tricky it's, you got to be it's, careful so you got to look back which is what that's part of the research that you do when you try to see if there's something different but I, you're right about dory miller they tried her a couple of times and they raised her which tells me that they thought she was doing well enough physically to, to stand the raise and give a chance now that they found out well she's not that good um, bring her back, but don't drop her below Correct. what you lost, what you claimed before. You just still want to protect your investment. Still showing signs of confi it's, confidence. Absolutely. I mean, she looks like she's healthy and should run a race. You spoke, you spoke about all weather tracks. And of course, we recently installed a tapita surface on the training track. How do you expect that to impact not only training, but also the racing? I think that what the management here found out is all the grass horses were tra training on the training track. And they would prefer to train on all weather. So that's to accommodate the grass horses. And a good thing. It is because half our races are in grass, you know. Sure. So, I, I, no, I, I would, I think it's great. I, I send all my young horses up north to, to train on the tapita because I like the surface for a young horse and, uh, and for a grass horse. Certainly a step in the right direction. Once again, proving that first bet in Sanita are leaders within the market nationwide. Race number seven begins the 50 cent late pick five. It also begins the $3 all turf pick three. And we kick things off sprinting six furlongs on the flat turf course for maiden special weight Calbred, three-year-old fillies, two scratches, actually three scratches, program scratch of the 10. Also take out the two also eligibles, 13 and 14. Leaves us with a good field of 11. And the morning line favorite number 11, Bits Tiger Magic from the Peter Miller Barn. One decent or or I should say, good debut effort. Now they switch over to the turf course. There is turf breeding in the pedigree. Talk to us about race seven. John. Well, I think John White probably or might have been tempted to make her a little bit lower, but 
he had to submit his morning line before Roberta's love, who beat her last time, came back and won the stake yesterday. So, Correct. So now you got Vince Tiger's magic. Her first race looks a little bit better than you think. And it looked yesterday. And uh, I thought she actually ran a winning race. I mean, 44, four to the half, going three quarters on the, this dirt track is absolutely moving for a first time starting three year old maiden cowbred filly. And she paid the price late, but she still hung on gamely, even though that she couldn't hang on. And I understand now why she couldn't. Uh, I think there's every reason to believe that she'll run just as well on turf as she did on the dirt. Second time starter, Peter Miller, 24% with a massive flat bet profit with that angle. So you expect her to run better. Uh, switching to Hernandez because Flavian is not here, I don't believe. So a uh, bit Tiger match. I, I should, be, should be able to pop the gate, open up, and just dominate. One thing we don't normally see, Jeff, is nine runners coming out of the same race, and that's exactly what we see here with the inside nine runners. They all exit the ninth race on March 9th, including, uh, like I said, the first nine. How do you evaluate runners coming out of a common race? Because there's a lot of emphasis placed on that particular race, but that doesn't mean how they're going to finish in this particular race. How do you kind of sort that out in general when you're looking at race replays? Well, the first thing I do is I try to figure out if it was a good race or not, because that'll... You know, if it was a, not, help you a lot, if it's not a good race, then you got nine horses you can try to throw at them. <laughs> but if you look at the race that those horses come out, um, at, that was the race on March 9th, and then you look at the race that Bits Tiger Magic comes out of, along with Epion, who's right alongside and was third in that same race, and you conclude, at least I did, Big that, that race was way tougher. Sure. So I was, it was easy for me to toss nine and just concentrate <laughs> on the bottom two. It's Tiger Magic and Epi. And I wouldn't be surprised if they run second, well, not second and third, this time first and second, just as they did last time they ran. Race number eight begins the 50 cent late pick four back sprinting on the main track. Six furlongs the distance. $12,500 is the claiming tag. A field of seven. Number four, Patron de Oro, the heaviest morning line favorite on the card at four to five. Very, very interesting horse here, Jeff, for a variety of reasons. I won't steal your thunder, but thumbs up or thumbs down on the favoritism. And do you think he's going to win today? Well, if I uh, knew this horse personally and could ask him if he had one more left, I would be more confident. That is the question, isn't yeah. it? Patron Dioro was a, a, a avoided claim uh, back in January. Somehow he managed to get back to the races, that, uh, and but they dropped him from 25 to 12.5, won that race, raised the notch as if the current trainer said, boy, I hope I lose this horse. I don't think I have much many. I don't think he has many left. He won that day. Didn't change leads, by the way. He won because he's just so much better. Now a low-profile trainer who doesn't win that many races, claims him for 16, gets him back to the barn and, and, and probably says, whoa, <laughs> I don't know how many of these horses, races this horse has left. Um, so he runs him back for 12-5 again, hoping to lose him, win the race for sure, and hoping that he has one good little left. Because the last thing in the world, you don't want to be the last guy to own a claiming horse. You want it's someone like musical to, chairs. Right. You, you, know, you take him and good luck with him. So if he has that ability, he'll win. The question well, is, can he come back to these previous races? And I don't know. And he's four to five on the morning line. Right. Is that a gamble to you? Not, not for at me. All. Not, not at for all. me. Now, I'm not saying that he won't win. I'm just saying I would never gamble on him. Yes. And if you need to play because you're playing a rolling exotic or a pick three or a pick four and you need to try to, uh, you have to, you just can't skip the race. Then you decide whether you think you take the chance or not. I mean, Lansdowne is being raised one level in the class. He just comes off a win. I mean, I think he's probably a little bit more dependable, but he's not as good as the other one. Correct. Maybe you double it and just try to survive in advance. Here's some statistics for trainer Keith Craigmal, who I, you know, obviously know is a very, very good trainer. And this is not an attack on Keith whatsoever, but a, a handicapping the races is an analytical game. And you have to look at his statistics throughout the last five years, which you can do courtesy of DRF formulator. So Keith Craigmal's barn first off the claim the last five years, two for 27, 7% wing clip. He's only ridden Tyler base four times over the last five years. Granted, Santiago Gonzalez is not riding today but he's 0 for 4 with Tyler Bays as well. So at 4 to 5, Jeff, I don't know who I'm going to play, but I do know I'm going to try and take a gamble and leave Patron Dioro off my ticket. You know, there's a possibility that he tried to get a better rider, and I said, nah, I think I'll sure. set out this race. Sure. You know? So you never know. So it's a guessing game, and it's one of these races where, um, let's put it this way, we got 11 races today, right? We sure we got, do. We got a lot better races. And a coast-to-coast coast pick five. We got a lot of better. We don't have to play every race. You know, We can pick and choose.
race number nine is the second stakes race on today's card. It's the Angels Flight Stakes. Again, coming down the hill this time for three-year-old fillies. Two scratches. Scratch the two and four. Leaves us with a field of seven. Lone from the feeder, Peter, excuse me, from the Phil D'Amato barn is the five to two morning line favorite. Hasn't been seen since Breeders' Cup Friday here at Sanita. Coming back off the long layoff for Phil. What say you about race nine, Jeff? Good race. Um, I ended up picking um, Antifana because she was so impressive winning the Sweet yes. Life. And it's interesting because she's had four races here in the States, and that was the only sprint. And her uh, best one. By far. Do you think maybe she's a late-running sprinter? <laughs> I think she is. Uh, she was certainly over in France. Um, now, she didn't beat a great field in the Sweet Life, but she did beat a good field. And I like the style that she uh, she used where Barrios allowed to let her settle and then kicked her in at the crossing of the dirt. And she really exploded in that. In that same race, Zona Verde uh, ran into a little bit of a roadblock. So I don't think there's that much difference. I think the winner will be one of those two. I think Phil's Philly uh, Lawn uh, from France, I think she's probably prepping for a distance of ground. I don't know if she has quite the turn of foot that either Zona Verde or Antifona or Antifona have. So I think it's going to be eight over six for me. And I think I'm going to try to get by uh, with just those two. Just a general question for you, Jeff. Number one, she is romantic, uh, was supplemented to the race by her connections for $2,000. That's obviously a sign of uh, confidence. You know, she she ran well on the flat turf course. She's never d been down the hill. She's 6-1 to one on the Moy line. Diego Herrera rapidly improving as a jockey. Give her any sort of a look for the she, exotics. Number she is, one, she is she romantic. romantic. Yep. Yeah. Um, I look at her form. I'm going to judge her by her form. And I'm going to say to you that I... I don't think she's quite good enough, but one of the reasons why I'm pretty sure Peter gave her a chance is it's good black type for a filly they gave a lot of money for. Sure, and, sure. Um, you know, they tried her once in the Jimmy Durante. That was a two-turn race. She proved that she could close. I think they'd be thrilled if they hit the board. Mm -hmm. um, when you get a filly like this, bred like she is, you, you want to get that out of the way. So, um, yeah, I think she's got a chance to uh, pick up some pieces and uh, – and and do some damage now that win that she had was on the flat course but there's no reason to think that her style won't work here either race number 10 becomes uh starts one of my favorite wagers the one dollar golden hour pick four linking our last two races here with the last two races at golden gate yesterday's wager paid in excess of seventeen hundred dollars for a one dollar wager and we kicked today's action off in race number 10 sprinting the abbreviated sprint distance of five and a half furlongs sixteen thousand dollar claimers non-winners of two races lifetime two program scratches one and eleven both will not compete the morning line favorite number two motor from the John Sadler barn, relatively lukewarm three to one morning line favorite broke the maiden for 20 now in for 16. That's a, that's a, that's a reasonable sort of a sort of placement for the Sadler barn. Talk to us about race 10, Jeff. I tell you what, I think they'd probably run them for 12, five if there was one. Sure. You know, I can, I tell you, I picked number two motorcade on top. Okay. So he's my top pick. Now I can give you 15 minutes of why I wouldn't bet on him, <laughs> <laughs> but I think he's capable of winning. He's inside speed, but I mean, he was kind of hanging on for dear life, and that was that was going three quarters, and he's going five and a half. So you'd think that's going to help, and I think it will. Um, he's another horse that doesn't change leads. He doesn't really have um, the ability to switch off early. He's going to bust out there and go, and he's going to try to hang on. And in a race that doesn't have a lot of closers in it or any closers in it, he might be able to hang on and survive. I didn't care for his all-weather uh, breeze uh, on March 31st. He he looked like he was really struggling towards the end of that uh, that work. So maybe he didn't like the service, or maybe he just got disinterested. He's going to be a short price. He's coming off a life-and-death win. He's not being protected in the case that John's figuring, I know what this horse is worth, you know, let's move on. Uh, I guess he could win, but I wouldn't be shocked if they ran, out, ran over him either. Fair enough. Let's take a look at the nightcap. Race number 11 offers $5 golden hour daily double wagering. Also, keep in mind, offers super high five wagering as well. And with the mandatory pad on all pools, the super high five has to be paid out no matter what happens in terms of the results. And we've got a good field of 11 here going one mile on the turf course for maiden special weight three-year-olds. Take note, number seven, Uncharted is a first-time gelding. Number five, and Ganu from the Michael McCarthy barn is the five to two Moy line favorite. Hasn't been seen since October, but McCarthy does well, does well off layoffs. Uh, talk, talk to us about race 11, Jeff. Well, here's where I probably outsmarted myself, because if you look at the form, Nganu really should win this race. Not only did he run second both times, he ran second in the stakes. Look who beat him last time out. And Endlessly. I mean, and he's back with maidens. Uh, first time Lasix off the bench. I mean, why wouldn't this horse be a short price and why wouldn't he win based on his last race? Well, what I saw in him is I watched him train and he trained well before his first start, but since he's been brought back, I have not been impressed with his works. He doesn't look quite like the same horse to me. 
So I'm going to gamble against him. But on the other hand, he's a turf horse working on dirt. What, what, why would I expect any more? Shouldn't hold that against him. I shouldn't. I am, but I shouldn't, you know. <laughs> so, but if he wins, and I certainly, if I'm playing a rolling exotica, uh, I'm going to use him. But uh, I'm going to try and beat him with Niti, number 10. He's a Leonard Powell trained three year old. Uh, uh, kind of gave him a run, didn't get off well first time out, and just kind of gave him a once around. Thought he ran well in his next start, knowing a mile and eight, uh, rallied wide, uh, really did well, uh, just couldn't get there. But um, I'm thinking he's one of these Europeans that's going to get better and better with age, back going a mile, which usually means quicker fractions. And I have a hunch he's going to produce a forward move. So uh, I gambled him, uh, gambled on Needy. I'm going to gamble on Needy at four to one on the morning line, but I'm absolutely going to uh, try to beat. In Ganu, but use them on my ticket because I don't want them beat me. Jeff, it's a handicapping lesson every time you join me on the seminar. It's a pleasure to have you join me. Thanks so much for your time and insight today. Keep up the great work, not only at the Sanita website, sanita.com, where you can find Jeff's work on a daily basis, but all the work you do behind the scenes for Sanita Simulcast team as well. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks to all of you as well. Keep in mind two things, two important announcements. First of all, the Coast to Coast Pick 5, $100,000 seated into the pool today, courtesy of First Bet. Also, as you heard Frank Miramati say, next week, no racing here at Sanita. Racing resumes, and that was a, a previously scheduled to break in the action the uh, the racing live racing resumes here a week from friday that'd be april 19th when live racing resumes at sandy hope you enjoyed the seminar everybody have a great afternoon and good luck ladies and gentlemen please rise for our national anthem Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park.
Here are the changes. The first race is the start of the 50 cent early pick five. In this race, number five, Mighty Kai, one pound over. In the second, number three, Bossy Bruingal, two pounds over. Race three, number five, headed for Ohm, two pounds over. Scratch number nine, Lovin' the Pavels. Race four, number one, Dance Man will carry one pound over. The fifth is the John Shear No High Five Wagering offered. Scratch number six, Nesso's Last Hurrah. Middle pick four wagering offered with race five. In the six, scratch number six, Deficit Maha, mandatory payout in all pools, including the pick six starting with the six. In the seven, scratch numbers 10, 13, and 14. Program scratch and the also eligibles are out. The all turf pick three starts with the seventh. Race eight begins the late pick four with no changes. The ninth is the Angels Flight, scratch two, Rascality, and four, Avoir. Two and four out of the ninth. In the tenth, scratch one, Midnight Mojo, and 11, Gotcha Looking. Those are program scratches. The Golden Hour pick four starts with the tenth. And the 11th, no scratches or jockey changes. Golden Hour double starts with race 11. Coast to Coast pick five today. We have seeded the pool with an additional $100,000. Every Saturday and Sunday, we offer the Coast to Coast pick five today, an extra 100000 in the pool, courtesy of First Racing. Low 15% takeout, $1 minimum. It starts with our third race today. Enjoy closing day of the classic meet. 24 minutes to post. Hey guys, this might be one of those rare occasions where I actually look tall. We have the four to six age group lining up over here. And if we turn the camera around, Sai, we'll see that there is somebody getting a head start over here. It hasn't started yet, but she's broke through the starting gate. We're gonna have to reload her and start again. She's gonna run back. My money won't be on her this time because once you break through the starting gate, we know it's all over. This is gonna be like the running of the bulls. Just look at all those kids lined up down there, ready to hunt down one of 36,000 Easter eggs that are out here on the infield. Do just want to remind you that we will have an Easter egg hunt after each race throughout the card up to race six. So we can see the age group four to six lining up here. I'm feeling very tall as we're about to have the running of the bulls. Now we got an Easter egg down here. I wonder if I can, I can cheat. I don't even know what's in here. Let's have a look. Don't, don't show the kiddies. This might be something really good. Michelle's going to get so jealous. What is it? Oh, look at this. Oh, and it's melted. <laughs> it's a Milky Way. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to eat this and hopefully we're going to have these kids lined up and we're going to get going. So, Sai is going to keep filming and we're going to have the running of the four to six years old. We should have Frank Muramadi really call this race. I think we're about to go. Let's wait. Drum roll, please. Nope, no, we got the phone call coming in. We're still waiting. There are Easter egg hunts from one to four years old, four to six and seven till 11. I chose the smaller group because I'm not sure I can compete with some of the 11 year olds here. They are absolutely towering over me. But just a terrific turnout here in the infield. We still have the infield carnival going. So if you wanna come out here, come on out. But we are waiting the start of the first of six Easter egg hunts. Let, let's see if I can go down and just get these guys going. It looks like we have a, an overflow crowd. This is like the running of the Kentucky Derby plus about 400 in here, the four to six year old group. We've got many handlers in the starting gate trying to stop these four to six year olds from acting up in the gate. We did already have one break through the starting gate a little bit earlier. We've loaded her back up and hopefully we're gonna set for a start in this age group, four to six. Are we ready for a start? I think we're ready for a start. We're ready? They're having a countdown. Oh, we got a couple of finishes down. We got a couple of down at the start. This is like the running of the bulls. I'm going with the Easter Bunny here front and center. She's got the pink basket here and we have one over here coming. This is amazing. I think I might have to get into the hunt. I'll see you later, guys. I'm gonna go and fill up my basket and no, I'm not sharing. Closing day at Santa Anita on Sunday. We have two prime plays for you, starting off in the third race. Uh, downhill turf dash, six and a half on the turf for our older fillies and mares on allowance race. We like number seven, Proof She Zips, as our prime play, even though she hasn't been out in almost a year. But this is a very fast filly, and on her best day, she is good enough to beat this field. And she's training like she's fit and ready. Here's a breeze uh, recently over the all-weather, and you can see her going very easily by herself beautiful mover nice easy action here this tells me that michael mccarthy has this daughter of idiot proof cranked and ready last time we saw her she was beaten ahead in a stakes race at golden gate fields uh, uh two turning but she can sprint as well she can route and she is fit and ready number seven proof she zips our second prime play of the day takes place in a maiden special weight race on grass for three-year-old fillies this race the seventh race six furlongs the distance and we're looking at a very fast filly named Bits Tiger Magic. This is a, uh, a Peter Miller trained filly who uh, ran very well in her debut this race last month. You can see her on the inside cutting out the fractions. Eventually she's going to get worn down by Roberta's Love, but that's not a bad thing because Roberta's Love yesterday won a stakes race following this race. So that's a live race that Bits Tiger Magic comes out of. She's switching the grass. I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. I like number 11, Bits Tiger Magic, to win the seventh race as a prime play Sunday at Santa Anita. And uh, they're off.
Well, thank you for joining us on this Sunday of racing at Santa Anita. I'm Millie Ball along with Jessica Pfeiffer, Michelle Yu. On the heels of a terrific day yesterday of racing, not only did we watch Frankie Dettori win six consecutive races, but we saw Stronghold win the Grade 1 Santa Anita Derby from the yeah. Tomato Bond. Michelle was picking winners, so it was a good day all around. Well, uh, race number one is coming up now. We are on the turf, a mile the distance for these non-winners of two lifetime claimers. Michelle, I'll start with you because you, your husband has a horse in here. So uh, tell us about Remote, please. So uh, Remote has been, at first he was just the benefit or the recipient, I should say, of a couple of really unlucky trips. Recently, he ran a little bit better um, down at Del Mar's race was okay. And then obviously the starter race two back was really good when he was coming through late. Last time, I don't think he got the best of trips either. And for some reason, even though he broke his maiden going a mile and a quarter, when we tried to stretch him out here in Southern California, he has had no punch going beyond a mile. So, um, you know, just looking at him here, trying to find a spot that he can be competitive at. So he's obviously taking a class drop down here he looked sensational walking over he's generally comes over very very well turned out he's just a very handsome son of warfront so i think this is a good spot for him my biggest concern today is going to be the trip because i don't necessarily want him on the lead although i used to mm -hmm. he just doesn't seem to have any additional kick when he's out in the front but to me there's just no speed in here the number five is an eight to one. That's Mighty Kai, who's a three-year-old in here facing older horses. Now, uh, he is uh, taking a significant drop in class, Jesse. How do you feel about him taking on Alders and, and his chances in here? I have him on my ticket a little bit, uh, like third or fourth, but I think that drop in class is definitely the most significant part of it. He hasn't run absolutely terrible races, so I think that this drop in class might just be the trick for him. And uh, we have a trainer race today. Doug O'Neill and Mark Glatt are head and head today, so it's going to be really exciting. I looked, and Doug O'Neill, I think, runs in every single race oh, except for the 10th. Holy Andrew, he said, it's yeah. going to be a long day today when I saw yeah. him at the barn. He runs morning. every single race. But Mark Latt only runs a few, but he has some good ones. And mm -hmm. the one in this race is the one I like the most today. That is the number two, Sync Tactic, at 14 to 1 Ooh. right now from a 5 to 1 morning line. He actually claimed him off of Doug O'Neill last time. And I thought he ran a really good race that day. He might be moving up in, a little bit in class today, but he has been working phenomenal. I worked him a few works back, and I really love the way he went. So I think he's just improved from being in the Glatt Barn. Well, I certainly like him returning to the grass. He broke his maiden special weight back in 22. But also, I have to be concerned, you know, with the big drop in class for him, and he still couldn't get it done at 16. This is, you know, we've got very few non-winners of two on the turf, so this is going to be a quote-unquote lateral move, non-two to non-two. Um, but maybe he just needs that little bit of extra. However, last time he ran against, you know, claiming horses on the turf, he, he barely split the field. Mm-hmm. They are uh, making a circle and they'll head out. Uh, currently two to one, the favorite. That's the number seven we chatted about. Remote. Now, uh, Moby Town is a four-year-old and he's going long for the first time. Do you think he's better on turf or do you think like I do that he's actually a better dirt horse? I actually quite think he's a better dirt horse just like you. However, he did only break his maiden for 20. So I think it is going to be a tough ask for him to come in first time against winners. I think the horse everyone's sleeping on right now is the four national Genero for George Papa Padromo. You take your you take your pen and just draw a line to that last race. He did not like the dirt. You go back his two prior. He fits at the non-two mm -hmm. and he's done it sprinting and routing. I think he's going to be able to set a handy trip behind the load speed in Moby Town, his old stable mate. And I think at four to one, he's a solid play. You heard it from Michelle. You, we are 10 minutes away from the opener. We will hear shortly from Peter Lurie and Zoe Cadman. Stay tuned.
Jake Cohen, ladies and gentlemen, bringing the horses onto the track for the first race. Started the early pick five. Post time is in nine minutes. A glorious Sunday here at the Great Race Place. And speaking of glorious, let's talk of Team Hansen here. Uh, fresh off big efforts in the 5Ks here, Olivia and Spencer. They brought a friend. What's your name? Sarah? Scarlet. Scarlet. Ah. Well, we're here with Ryan Hansen. Since he's here, let's give him a talk. Ryan, the horse last time out remote. Mile and eighth, maybe just a little too far for this one. You cut back to a mile. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, he when we go a little farther he shows too much speed and then he doesn't seem like he's got enough to finish with so hopefully they go a little faster in front of him today ideally where would you like to see this horse early oh i'd like to see him covered up sitting you know in the second group comfortable all right all right spencer you've been snapping at the bit here what uh, what do you want to say hope he wins hope he wins what do you think i think he's gonna win because he's been doing really good Listen to these trainers. All right, Charlotte, you got you to get Scarlett. You got to get your words in. I think he's going to be in the top three at least. I, I okay, from now on, I'm just talking to the kids. That's it. Ryan, we appreciate the time. Good luck in the race. Thanks, Pete.
Horse is getting set for race number one. If I feel a little bit jumpy, I think I might be on a sugar high. I've probably eaten about six Easter eggs already. Just a reminder that we will have the Easter egg hunt after every race up to the sixth race today. So get on the out to the infield and get your Easter eggs. All right, let's take a look at some of these horses. The three Derrico Dandy had a really nice warm up. Juan Hernandez took this one away from the pony immediately. He got an A plus for the warm ups. Hernandez was aboard this one two starts ago, so he knows him quite well. And I figure he wants to be a little bit closer to the pace. God, he looked good warming up. So Derek O'Dandy certainly wins the warm up for me for trainer Ed Moja. The five Mighty Kai got a nice solo warm up as well. In fact, he was warming up just up until about a couple of minutes ago, jogging around under jockey Edwin Maldonado. And then finally, the seven remote. He looks about the same as he did last time, perhaps getting a, a little bit hot, but nothing that could take away from the fact that he ran a good race last time for Tyler Bays. And I like what Ryan had to say about him. Looks like he'll be just off the pace today, but remote looks really good out here. But as far as the warm up, guys, it goes to the three, Jericho Dandy, as we wait for these horses to cross over onto the turf course to pick up, kick off the early pick five. We're getting ready for race number one. Good luck. Horses are at the starting gate. It's post time. Loading in for the opener at the Great Race Place. This is the final day of the classic meet. We'll take next weekend off and back on Friday the 19th. Mandatory payouts in all pools today. Smoke going in. Retro Dandy, National Genero, and my partner Glenn to the outside. 